Welcome everybody to another episode of Bootstrap Solo. I am your host, Pratik Shah, and today we're going to be talking about the good, the bad, and the ugly about running your own practice. This podcast is for those that want to know what it's really like to start, run, and grow a practice. Today's guest is John Yanni Boren. He runs a true solo practice called uh, Yanni Law out of both South Carolina and San Diego, California, and he focuses solely on personal injury. He started his practice back in 2014 and has been growing strong ever since. Yanni, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Pratik. No, man. Thanks for being on. So this is going to be a lot of fun. I mean, I know you and I talk about this kind of stuff all the time, so I'm glad to get on here and get it recorded. But, you know, one thing that's always been interesting to me is you run a, you run a South Carolina practice and a San Diego, California practice. You're obviously licensed in both states. I know you're licensed in Texas as well. How do you do that just being a one-man show? Well, I first start by any chance I get, I tell people I'm coast to coast because it just makes me sound more successful. And <laughs> so, you know, I think those thanks for giving me that plug. The uh, the big thing is having loving to travel. Yeah, I want to go back and forth because I, I am truly coast to coast because I do actually move back and forth, back and forth and in between. So I do it. Um, I think the only way you do it is because you want to do it because it is miserable at times. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. there's got to be, you got to spend a lot of your time traveling. How much do you think of your time do you spend traveling? I think in 2018 and 2019, I calculated like the travel days and times because I was starting to think like, man, I'm traveling a lot. How much time am I actually spending versus like if I was in one pl place? And so it was like 32 actual days of travel. So it'd be like me wow. not working for basically a month out of the year. Right. And just right. on the travel with the layovers because- People say all the time, oh, you can work on a plane, you can do this, but I take a lot of red eyes or I'll take these weird flights or it's hard to get into a groove and do any meaningful work other than read a few chapters in a book. And so the last couple of years, um, 2021, 20, 22 has really been a true 50-50 back and forth. And of course, you know me, I, I've got cases in between too, so I go different places. But yeah, it's a lot It's a lot of travel, a lot of, a lot of miles. I mean, I, I got to imagine, I know you've been doing this a while since 2014, but I got to imagine the last couple of years as everything's kind of shifted to remote, that's probably helped out a lot. It has um, in a lot of respects. It has, I mean, being able to do like depositions, mediations, especially not having to be somewhere. But there is, you know, and we won't get into this today about the AI thing, but there is a, a, a piece of humanity that is required in our lives, right? To just yeah. be there. And I think that... uh it's hard for me just to like not be somewhere for six months and really nurture relationships and be there for my clients. Even if I don't really see them, I can say, look, I'm in, I'm in San Diego or I'm local. And I think that makes them feel like, Hey, my, my attorney's not just off somewhere across the country running around. And, uh, definitely I've always been virtual to some degree. It's just now everyone else has really caught up to it and left me behind on it. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, uh, you were ahead of the game. That's the way we're going to phrase that. We we got to spin it. Yeah, you it were, was, you it were was ahead easy, of your time. It was an easy transition into COVID. I was like, finally, this is what I live for. Finally, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah you, had been set, you had been set yourself up for that. And it just, unfortunately, it took a pandemic for everybody else to sign on board for what you were doing. I mean, right. you know, the idea of having to fly back and forth, um, you know, to take depositions or whatnot just seems like a nightmare. But let's talk about kind of your, your split. I want to get into what you talked about in regards to nurturing relationships and that. But before before that, let's talk a little bit about your practice right now. How are you split between litigation, pre-litigation? How do you do that? Yeah, so I typically, lit, I'll do the cases like 100 grand below. I can handle pretty fairly on my own. Anything above, I started co-counsel or started to refer out just because the stakes is higher usually and then there's more work involved and more more things like that. So I did as my case volume have, has grown, I'm not able to really litigate as many cases as I used to because I have so much more in pre-lit. So I really try to focus on really the quality pre-lit uh, build. That way, you know, the case will settle more likely if you treat it like it's going to trial right, you do it right. And then um, the lit, I really try to just minimize for myself, but then if there's anything that's excess. And so I try to keep maybe five to 10 cases max on my own on lit. And then anything over, I just, I just refer out because at the end of the day, when you get lit, you have to prosecute, you have to be moving that case along. Other it sits there and it never settles. It's not fair to the client. So everything for me, it's like, what is the best interest of the client and am I serving them the best? 
Yeah, and, and it sounds like, you know, when you talk about these numbers of, hey, you know, I try to stay between five and 10 in litigation, it sounds like that's something you've kind of uh, obviously took time to realize, right? Did you have a bunch of cases in litigation in the beginning that you realized, hey, this is just overwhelming? Or were you always just kind of being a little slower and methodical about deciding which cases you wanted to prosecute? Because I know you've done some trials. I know you try cases. And, you know, obviously I, I've tried to, I've tried cases as a solo. It's a nightmare because your whole practice shuts down. There's nobody there to help you. So I got to imagine that, that, that tipping point, you kind of hit that at somewhere. Yeah, no, for sure. Because, you know, in the early beginnings, I wasn't just doing PI. I was doing like literally everything. Admin laws, so I was doing admin trials, traffic laws, doing traffic trials, I was doing um, all kinds of crazy things that I didn't even know existed just because that's the way the firm was. So I was doing all these things. And so I had a lot of my, I was very spread very thin, but you're right. I'm when I started doing like, you know, PI trials, especially because a criminal trial is different than a PI trial. You can argue the stakes are harder in the criminal trial because it's freedom. But in terms of prepping and showing up and doing things right, like, you know, even a three day civil trial for me is a lot, a lot of resources. And so what I realized, I think was that the, the just to click in the clients where they being served. Right. And so over time, as I started getting into the weeds of lit and realizing like, oh, not everything settles, like they actually do go to trial and uh, having to face with these, you know, trial deadlines and things like that. And I'm like, oh, it hits hard and fast in the last, you know, 120 days. And especially if you haven't done things and who does extra depots, you know, a year in advance, you usually do them the last three months. So, you know, we just settled one recently where I thought I was going to settle and I took over for, for another, another firm who worked at a prelit and ended up facing 10 depositions. And luckily I worked it up enough to where we, we settled it. But it's just one of those things where I learned pretty early that, my, you know, my limitations on how many litigation cases, if you do it right, because anyone can have 40 cases in lit and then they just sit there right. for two years. And then all of a sudden you're settling just to settle because you didn't work the case up. But getting some early trial experience and really seeing how these cases need to be worked up really put me in a, in a space where like, okay, I need a limit. Because, you know, I was also told and learn this, that you have to try cases or at least be like, I'm going to be on the pleading and take it to trial. The insurance companies start to see like, you're, not, you're just scared or you're never going to go. So we'll never pay you. Yeah. So, you know, let's talk about that. I mean, you know, trying personal injury cases are expensive. Uh, it's not cheap to get the doctors up there and all that stuff. And, you know, an admin in an admin trial, criminal trial, very different, very different, right? You can, if your clients, uh, your clients will usually pay for that expert. They have to, or you could petition the court in a criminal trial and say, hey, my client's indigent. Um, can we get the court, uh, the county to pay for an expert? And you could do that. So balancing that as a solo, I, I got to imagine in 2014, you didn't start with a huge war chest. No, I didn't. And, you know, like I want to preface this. I was thinking about like, you know, we, like what I want to talk about today and stuff. Like I probably am the only solo lawyer or one of the only solo lawyers that did not want to be a solo lawyer. Bro. I did not want to go and open my firm when I did. I mean, eventually I did. But at the time I did, and I kind of did it begrudgingly uh, for a host of reasons, but um, I certainly did not have um, the war chest, you know, the the few hundred thousand dollars there ready to roll, ready to rumble, you know, seven figure cases or anything like that. I had what I had. So I just made it, yeah. I made it work and collect, over time, you know, hustled and collected the bounties of my, um, yeah. of my, you know, of my cases. And then, you know, eventually the the PI stuff started hitting. But then you're like, well, I have this money now. Now I've got a hundred grand in a PI case that is literally on black or red, you know, however you want to phrase it. And then you go to trial or you go to a trial and you see like, oh, we didn't win. What does that mean? Oh, that means you don't get paid. Oh, also you don't get your cost back. Oh, also the, you know, the client doesn't get anything. So when you see that happen, it's like, you really got to think about it, but it definitely right. was a slow, slow, slow start. Yeah. So why do you say you, you didn't want to start a solo? I mean, usually... When we talk to people, a lot of them say, hey, I, I knew I never didn't want to work for anybody. I knew this. I knew that. Sounds like that wasn't the case for you. I mean, working for people sucks for the most part, unless you're like a drone or a bot. And even then they'll learn eventually that it's not fun and they'll probably re revolt. But yeah. um, like the imposter syndrome thing, you know, gets talked about a lot. And I don't really like ever felt I had it other than opening the firm when I did because I was working for this firm here, you know, in California. And my first two jobs just didn't, weren't great. One was in South Carolina and that's when I moved to California and I came here and it just, it was like a, 
a newer firm and I, I left out after a year because I just, things just weren't working out. I was like, man, what am I going to do now? You know, like I didn't, I didn't, I never felt like I had the skills or anything to offer a firm. So I didn't want to go and be like, oh, look, hire me because I'm this badass lawyer. I really wanted to work for someone or a firm to get that experience. And I'm willing to take the beatings, right? Just I'll, don't pay me anything. Just pay me a knowledge, pay me an experience. Let me get this skill set going so I can, you know, go fly later. But I just felt like I, I wasn't ready for it. And maybe, you know, some people say, oh, you'll never be ready for it. Like having kids, you just got to do it. But I just felt, you know, financially, experience wise, I, now you have to worry about, you know, the business owner. And it was funny because I would, you know, tell people in that first six months where I really wasn't really claiming to be like a law firm owner. I was just a lawyer floating, looking for jobs and things like that. And they're like, oh, wow, you own your own law firm. And I'm like, not like that, man. It's not <laughs> like, not not like that kind of own law firm. Not a real like, firm. Yeah. This is kind of like a indentured servitude, like against my will sort of thing where I'm just trying to like hustle and make, make a living here until, you know, I get a job and I get with something and you know, I did, I do enjoy, I did enjoy the firm culture in terms of just having people and going to the office and bouncing ideas and never having to worry about payroll while I'm trying to learn how to be a lawyer and not having to worry about bills while I'm trying to learn how to like, you know, generate cases and things like that. But I think that's what it was. It was like, I was always just really good at generating cases. When I took that leap, it did snowball into a monster. And I think about a year later, like mid 2015, I was like, I guess I'm a solo. I guess I'm guess I'm doing this now because I became too busy to go look for jobs. I remember just thinking about like I haven't looked for a job in a while. I haven't put a right. resume out for a while, and it's because I had gotten so many cases so busy. I was kind of entrenched in my in my firm. And then after you know a year or two, you start to actually get experience, start to learn. Really, you know, because you're in the fire, and maybe maybe that's what I needed is I needed to be thrown into the fire. Well, you know, here's kind of a tough question for you. Do you feel that if you had gotten that job offer that was, you know, maybe a six figure salary benefits, you probably wouldn't have been a solo. Oh, certainly not right away. No way. I mean, the job that I left, I literally asked them to pay me five grand a month because they were really like paying me much at all. It was like kind of like a weird discretionary thing. And I was just like grateful to have a place where I yeah. could go and like sit and learn and, you know, my bills were paid and that was fine. But I mean, I would have been happy with $60,000 a year. I would have been happy with like, you know, something north of that. But I mean, certainly six figure guy would have been like popping champagne, like I'm rich, you know, I'd have been, yeah. I never had ever made money like that. So yeah, I think, uh, you know, maybe eventually, you know, you see it in this industry, you see it, how like you make the money. And then after you start seeing the actual business, how it works and the settlements and you get the cases, you generate them and you're like, oh, I think I can probably go do this on my own and not have to worry about like, but in the seat, making a flat salary, only getting 1% generation fee or whatever, whatever it may be. So I think, right. you know, you're right, right away, no. And I would have been fine with that if, as long as it was a place where I was learning and, and Well, it sounds that. like you had a couple of jobs in the beginning that just, you know, it wasn't the pay issue. It was just a matter of wasn't a right fit for one reason or another. Yeah, I just, I mean, the first one, in, you know, in South Carolina, it wasn't a PI firm. It was, I was doing real estate law. It was completely completely different. And I remember like the partners were like, you're not going to like this. And I'm like, I just need, I need to work somewhere. Cause it was yeah. right after the 08 stuff. Right. So it was like 2011. We weren't quite out of that um, hole. So it was in Charleston, the, the market's not like what it was today by any means. So the opportunities are definitely limited. So I just was like, Hey, I'm going to take the, I'm going to interview everywhere. And the first person that says, welcome aboard, I'm jumping on. I don't care what it is. But, you know, I think it was a condition of try a lot of things. And I was more concerned with being a lawyer and building skills and making money. Certainly in those first few years, I didn't care about money. It wasn't like I need to go make a bunch of money. I just wanted to get my feet wet and not be like wet behind the ears. And I didn't want to be, I wanted some kind of skill because you just didn't get that in law school. Yeah. Yeah. It's totally different. Being a lawyer is totally different from being a law student. I mean, I think anybody that's been a lawyer for longer than 17 seconds realizes that that that's two different skill sets. So, okay, 2014, you decide to start your own firm. By default, you start realizing, hey, look, you know, I, I've got people calling me for cases. I mean, usually we run into the opposite, right? People are like, I had to call all these people. I had to go have all these lunches and dinners trying to hustle up business. It sounds like some of the stuff you were getting the calls, you had more like inbound stuff. 
I mean, how did how did you manage to do that so early on? Yeah, no, it was a problem because, you know, first I wanted to tell, I had to say yes to everybody, whatever it was, right? So I was spending half my time learning new areas of law because I'm not telling anybody no. And I don't care how crappy case is or how little $100 speeding ticket, I'll go drive three miles to Rancho Cucamonga and fight it, right? So other than like, maybe I just had a really big social life growing up and being in the restaurant business and just having a lot of friends and like things like that and like always holding myself out and telling everybody, screaming from the rooftops, right? Like in law school and afterwards, like we go to the bar or something. I'm like, hey, I'm, I'm in law school. I'm going to be a lawyer. You know, here's, I, in law school, I made cards. I have one around here somewhere. And everybody clowned on me for making cards. Like, oh, like, because our law school would make them for us with our name, like JD Candidate. I thought it was super cool, but I'm like, well, that's an easy way to get people to hand it out. So I did a lot of that. And so my summer jobs, I would generate business for my firms that I was clerking for because I would go out all the time. Um, And then I worked a restaurant job during the summers too. So I was just always constantly like, I'm a lawyer, I'm a lawyer, I'm a lawyer, you know, like I'm in law school at the time. And then when I got out and passed the bar, I just was obsessed with telling everybody like, I'm a lawyer, I'm this, I'm that. So maybe a function of that, you know, just screaming it out into the universe. And then also, you know, having friends that, you know, in the restaurant industry or where I grew up or, you know, none of my friends, none of my friends grew up to go be lawyers, right? A lot of blue collar, a lot of that. So in that respect, like I was the lawyer in the group. So then, you know, just recognizing some of those advantages you have in the the community of who you are and what you're doing. How can you help people that don't have access? Because it wasn't like, I mean, everyone thinks about Instagram and Facebook and all this was around in the way it is today. And it's not, there wasn't a 30,000 lawyers on there saying three things to do if you're in an accident, right? <laughs> you couldn't just inbox them. You had to call the firm, call the secretary, get an appointment, go to the office. It wasn't now where people are literally on the street begging for cases. Right. And my thing was that if I said yes to everybody and did my best, the best I could, and just whatever money you had to pay me, pay me. And then of course the PI stuff, you don't have to pay me. That they would then turn to their friends or family and say, hey, this is the guy you need to use. This is the lawyer. And that's really where I began to see the traction in my referral sources was by getting those results, getting them paid, and then saying, hey, you know, following up with them, calling them on birthdays, following up later, saying, hey, how are you feeling? Six months later. And so my my thing was like, people were like, oh, you're going to advertise? And I'm like, I can't handle the business. You know, I just, I have too much. And it sounds like kind of crazy, but it was too much for me, right? Because I was by myself and there was no way I was even going to embark on trying to hire at that point. Right. You're you know? almost like the anti-lawyer ad. You're like, no, don't call me. Call somebody else. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, <laughs> I because like, I remember in the first few months, after I, so when I left that job in California, you coincided, I was in the National Guard and I went for my annual training. We had three week training up in Death Valley. And I remember like, I'm going to go to this training and I'm going to get paid for it. So I'll have some money to survive. And I'm like, I'll worry about whatever happens when I get back. I go back and bartend if I have to, you know, pay bills. It's, it's whatever. And I remember like coming back and like sitting on my couch and being kind of like despondent, like just one day, I don't know, like a Tuesday or something, just thinking like, what am I going to do? What's going to happen now? I'm going to, got to get up and like find a job and this and all that. And then my phone rang one, one phone call from, from an attorney I had worked with on his other case. She, and she was like, Hey, I'm moving out of state. I've got a few cases. You want them? And I'm like, yeah, I don't care what they are. Anything. She goes, they're criminal cases. They are paid cash. So it was an influx of cash right there. Boom. And you know, it really like helped me kind of bridge the gap into, you know, the, that summer, you know, and then like kind of, kind of roll there. And then, you know, every month, I think by case, like even, even switch our first few years, every month I'm like, that's is it. I'm not getting any more cases. I'm not, yeah. I mean, like I got lucky. I got lucky. My, my boy, you know, my, my bro in uh, South Carolina got injured. I mean, it sounds crap, but I'm like, I got lucky that he got injured so I could get paid, but right. that can't happen all the time. Right. Not every single right. one of my friends can get, you know, injured which actually is not really true because I think most of them have. Oh, but, Jesus. you know, every month it's like, oh, this is it, this is it. I'm going to get a job next month, right? But it, there was always an insecurity, but looking back on it, it was flush. Right, And now right. I didn't get like, you know, catastrophic, like, you know, semi-cases. But right, right, there right. was like, you know, good wrecks and 
surgical and DUIs and all this other stuff, all of it came, you know, in one form or another. But the word of mouth, I mean, that thing just took off and I, you know, didn't even really have a website or anything. So it wow. was it was just uh very fortunate to to have that. So and that's a that's a function of, of good customer service, but my, my natural question becomes as you've got an influx of cases and word of mouth and reputation based, um, how come you didn't just pivot to saying, hey, I, I don't want to say no. Let me just find staff um, and start growing. It seems like your decision to remain solo was intentional. Yeah. So a couple of things. First is I was always cash insecure. I right. always literally thought like, this is it. I'm never getting paid again. Like I just did. I'm like, where are they coming from? I'm not advertising. Right. Right. Like, so, you know, right. so I didn't get, I didn't quite understand the business aspect of like word of mouth and it's spreading and stuff like that. The other issue was, you know, I never realized, and especially early on, I mean, I, I, I'm dumb maybe, but I didn't realize how much of a business a law firm is. I yes. always thought it was a service, like we're lawyers, we're not business people, right? It's completely yeah. not true. You see it now, these firms that grow. And I think if I had just, I think part of it is just not have, not wanting to do it. So not having a plan, not being intentional with the plan to go out. Right. So I never was focused on scaling, hiring this or that. But my, my, my fear was I would hire somebody and like, let's say it was the right hire. I'd run out of money month too, and then they'd have to go. Like yeah. that was always the thing. So I didn't. I don't think I quite had in those first few years an understanding of really what I even wanted. And then, um, like getting the cash and security it took, a, it took a couple of years to feel like confident, like, okay, I got this cash flow it's still here. I'm not, I haven't gone bankrupt yet. Maybe I should look yeah. into trying to hire, which of course, you know, as you know, it's a whole nother nightmare for me. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think hiring is tough for everybody. I mean, it's hard because a lot of people kind of know the application interview game. Um, and they know how to present themselves really well, then they start and maybe it's not a good fit or maybe they have the skills, but it's not a personality fit or maybe it's a personality fit and they don't have the skills and uh, it, yeah. it becomes a whole thing. And every once in a while you get lucky, but I, I think anybody who's run a business in any shape or form can tell you and agree with that, that hiring is difficult. I mean, it seems like you haven't been like you're a solo where you don't have a full-time employee, but it's not that you've never wanted to hire. It's that going through that process and understanding the financial side of it has kind of made you want to stay away from that. Is that fair to say? Well, yeah, because I tried it, right? So I did make some hires. I mean, back 2017, I hired um, an in-house full-time paralegal. Now, granted, you know, it was on the cheaper side and she was working at another firm just wanted out for whatever reason, right? And took the plunge, inter gave, did the interview, but had no idea how to interview, right? I mean, just like, oh, you know, like you talked about like, oh, you said all the right things. Okay, yeah, you, whatever. And, you know, brought her in, you know, in-house and tried to, I guess, I'm like, you know, you worked at law firm, you know how this works, right? She's like, yeah, I was like, here's how we do it. Okay, boom, 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 boom. And then um, trying to hire a couple other people that just were not, just didn't want to work, you know what I mean? Like for anyone that kind of wanted to be solo. So, so six months paid her, you know, paid her for six months and she was really good. I found out at like, you know, padding the files because I check them and I'm like, okay, it looks like work's being done. But I didn't even really know how to check at that point very well. Right. Because six months right. later, I'm like, wait, 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 I'm literally running out of money. This can't be right. Where's, why right. I have no, why, why is anything settling? Something should settle, you know, in six months. And so, I did, I just did an audit one weekend. I sat down, went to, you know, her little office. I went through, got on the computer, looked at, cause we used to keep physical files like back in the day that not even that long ago, I would keep physical and a uh, virtual file because this way I had always done it. And I'm looking at the files and I just see a lot of like repetitive, like called the hospital to request a record like 18 times in one file, right? Like two weeks spent on that one task. And so I'm looking at the files and I'm like, literally nothing was done on any of these files. And that's why yeah. I'm them selling. So, you know, I learned the the office I was in was a share office with a couple of attorneys and they actually walked me through on how to fire. So I learned how to fire, you know, especially wow. in California. So I learned that because I'd never done that before. 
And I just spent the next two months just all day, every day working these cases just to get them up so I could, because I was like literally running out of money. And I had to get them settled because they were all primed to settle. But it was just a function right. of like getting a demand together, getting the things together. And I, I staved off bankruptcy that year. And I was like, oh my God, I'm never hiring anybody else again. I'm never doing it. Yeah. Like this is insane. And I think I was, I was very gun shy for a long time. And I mean, you know, still am because- I've well, tried I mean, other... that's an expensive, that's an expensive lesson to learn, right? That's, I mean, to lose six months of paying somebody without getting any kind of production or Not any valuable production, settled, yeah. you know, um, it, and then getting onto the verge of watching your bank account dwindling is that's, that's scary. Yeah. You know, I think the big, another lesson was cause like I put a lot on, you know, not a lot on her, but I gave her the cases and I'm, I'm going to go network. I'm going to go get cases because cases were coming in. Like that wasn't an issue because I was able to free up some of my, my time that I wasn't doing the medical records and I wasn't doing the admin stuff that I thought she was doing. So I was able to generate a lot of cases that summer and, you know, six months, but now I have all those cases plus the, you know, her load of cases. And, um, you know, I think that that was just kind of an awakening that for me that I can't just rely on someone else to do it. Like I have to, I mean, I don't want to say a micromanage, but I have to audit. I have to be checking every week. You have to manage yeah, at least. It's not yeah. fair to the client, right? It wasn't fair to the client. So, I mean, any client, you know, I remember like anything that was like, that was wrong or should have settled early. I just gave the clients a discount. I didn't even tell them why, but I'm like, yeah, you know, this should have sold three months ago. Here's a couple extra grand. And I just cut my feet out because I felt horrible that that was on me, you know, because yeah. you can't turn the dot you know, blind eye. I just so glad it happened then in that situation and not maybe down the road on something bigger. Yeah. But again, it was OJT, right? On the job training, I'd never really been a a law law firm manager before, right? And understand right. And, how well, this works. Well, and if you haven't worked at a law firm for a while, I mean, I think a lot of us kind of just learn on the fly because if you haven't worked at a firm for a while, and you, you know, maybe you haven't ran a business before, and you're kind of trying to learn all these things, and then you know, you brought up a good point about employment laws in California versus South Carolina versus Texas, they're going to be different. And you got to understand what paperwork needs to be done in one state versus another state and not expose yourself to any type of liability. Yeah. No, there's different mechanisms to it. And um, I was like, you know, the, the attorney was like, you're going to bring her in, you're going to give her a hundred bucks. And I'm like, what? I'm not paying her. I'm like, I was so young. I'm not giving her a dime. He goes, well, then get sued. And I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, you're going to pay her for her time to come in to fire her and you're going to overpay her. So she'll never have a claim against you for that hour wage violation that she's going to go run and do. You know what I mean? Wow. So yeah. I was like, I kind of said, I was so angry because I felt so cheated for six months. Right. Cause she was like so nice and sweet and just telling me all these things. And when I would be like, why isn't this ready? She'd be like, oh, it's almost ready. You know? And then I just felt like so betrayed. Yeah. And so to write, give her one more dollar, I was like over my dead body, but you know, it was good advice and I did it. And I'm glad that I, that he was there to kind of help me understand the parameters of, you know, the traps on employment law in California, where, you know, you don't pay him $1, you could be on the hook for thousands of dollars in fines and all these violations. Yeah. Right. So, you know, things like that you learn because you don't learn that again in law school unless you know, you're at a firm, right? And so just a lot of learning and then just the lessons on like, hey, you know, recognizing that I've been here, what's the play? Yeah. You know, how do I? And and there seems to be, you know, and and I, I agree with you that I think um, as you've seen with people you've worked for and people I've worked for, there are there are lots of employers that mistreat their employees and, and, you know, try to get away with a lot of stuff, either underpaying or, you know, not following the rules or whatnot. But I think that a lot of, you know, people trying to do the right thing, like you get, get caught up in that too, because I think sometimes employees just assume that all employers are a monolith and just fall into that little, um, oh, they're this rich, evil people that are just taking all the money and not paying us what's fair type of thing. And then kind of the little guy gets a, gets a, a raw deal a little bit. Yeah, no, I 100% agree. And I think there's a lot of employee abuse because I felt like, you know, to a degree, I was in that position, right, where I was getting not compensated correctly and a few other things, right? But I mean, for me, I just moved on, right? And that's not everybody's. Yeah. I mean, some people are like, I, you know, th th 
it wasn't like that bad. So, uh, but certainly there's a lot of terrible bosses, horrible bosses, right? The movie, horrible For bosses. Sure. There's a lot of horrible bosses. It's not funny. And, you know, California's employment code is pretty stout, very employee friendly. And I, you know, I did employment cases too, especially around that time. You know, wait, a lot of wage and hour cases, sexual harassment cases, um, things like that. So I learned, you know, there's some real bad dudes out there and do that yeah. to be frankly. Okay. So you're going through this 2014, 20, or, you know, you're hiring these people, not working out. You're, you're fighting off the financial problems of, Hey, I might run out of money. I mean, when you were in that moment of looking at that bank account, if you're having a full-time employee for six months and realizing that they didn't really help you in the business at all, and you had to go in there and clean it up, were you at a point where you were like, Hey, it's time for me to start looking for a job because this may not work out. Or did you feel like I I'm going to be just fine? No, I mean, I remember like telling, you know, going home for Christmas that year and telling my mom, like, I'm done. I'm going to get out. I'm probably going to get out of the law, but certainly I got to close my shop. I got to get out of this because it's just like, I felt like I was going in circles, you know, it'd been two and a half, what, two and a half years. So two and a half years. And I'm just like, I should be way doing way better. I, I just maybe don't cut out for this. So I made that declaration and, you know, the problem was like, I just was so busy working on the cases. I'm like, I'm going to get through this batch and then I'm done. But then a new batch comes in, right? And it's, unless you're super intentional about it, unless you're really, it's on the calendar and you're committed, like this is closing date. I don't care what happens. Then you just keep going. And that's, you know, I kept going. And so I think what happens is you get a good case, you know, I had some really good cases settle right after that, you know, so I'm like, flush again. Okay. I'm good. You know what I mean? Like I got some money in the coffers. I'm going to survive because you get into the highs yeah. after getting out of that lows and thinking you're done. And, you know, it's really like self-reflection on me. It's like, you know, cause I can't put it all on her. I mean, obviously no, I'm, no, compl right. I'm complicit right. in the fact that I failed, you know, her in a way of just not catching that in the first couple months. Right. So, but I wasn't definitely not in a rush nor in the mood to entertain another employee because right. I'm like, I'm just going to keep, stay small. I'm going to do this. And again, even at that time, I just didn't get the whole scale thing. Right. I just didn't, I just felt like I needed a million dollars a month for advertisement. I needed partner 800 employees. I can't even get one employee. How do you scale? Yeah. Like yeah. I can't get one. Like yeah. I'm not, I'm no, just gonna, I know what you eat. You know, I, I can't get one. So, you know, I think, you know, around right after the time too, I had a, another case that I was kind of, you know, the, another hard lesson I was banking on, which I've talked to you about, you know, I was banking on this at the end of the following year and it didn't work out. And then it was like Armageddon, you know, cause it was like, oh my God. So a lot of ups and downs, but it's at the end of the day, you know, you, this grass isn't always greener and so many people come from the firm. So like, oh, I'm so happy to be a solo. I'm so happy to own my yeah. apartment. I'm like, that's amazing. I just didn't experience it really that way yeah yeah you know? it sounds like you kind of more um maybe it's not the right phrase but it was more like kind of fell into it and you realized it was like moving forward and then got a little bit more rope and got a little bit more rope and just kind of kept going and realized that this was probably better than the alternative but it wasn't that you wanted to be this big business owner and this was the dream you always wanted to walk out on a firm it wasn't anything like that. It was just, hey, one day my phone rang. I got a couple of criminal defense clients and thought, let's see how far this goes. And next thing you know, here you are nine years later. Yeah, it was, It really was like um, survive in advance, you know, just like worry about this batch of cases, worry about these clients this month, this three months, right? And I'd get a settlement, you know, if I got a settlement, I got a paycheck, you know, or someone paid me 10 grand. I'm like, you know, going out and eating crab legs, right? I just put aside a hundred bucks for that. And then I'm like, all right, how many months till I'm on the street, right? How many months <laughs> rent is this? So right. let me just, you know, keep going and stuff. And, but, you know, I think the, the big thing is like, I just couldn't, you know, again, the advertising, the, the scaling, all that. I'm like, I don't know how to do it. And I think looking back, I didn't realize especially early on how, and maybe, maybe they weren't, but it just seems like people were definitely open to help, right? Like I... Her stories like you and other people calling law firms for cases. Like, hey, you any cases you, you can settle me or send me, you know? And I'm like, they're giving cases away? Like, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, who would ever give a case away? I will take anything <laughs> off the street. Like, I'm not giving anything away. 
I'm like, these people are just giving these cases. I mean, of course, you know, the referral fees and stuff, but I didn't even know that was a thing to do. Right. Yeah. It wasn't even on my radar. It wasn't even on my, you know, anything. And, um, so it was just a lot of, a lot of unknown. A lot, like, there's such a, I just like, laughing at that. They're giving cases. <laughs> I just kind of, I'm like, I learned, I'm like, I just had to call these bigger firms that didn't want, they, there's cases they don't want that are like selling for a hundred grand. That's too low for them. I'm like, oh my God, I could not believe that. So look, I mean, we can go back in time and I'm like, man, I could have been so amazing, but I just didn't know. And then I, cause I didn't, I just didn't have that experience. I mean, there's other people who did, you know, there's other lawyers we know that scaled to infinity in five years, three years, like insane. Yeah. And I'm like, damn. You know, that's amazing. I just didn't even know that was possible. And I think it's hard to do things if you don't know they're possible. They don't even know they're like on the menu. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's part of the reason for this podcast, right? Honestly, like it's, 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 it's to let people know, like, Hey, I felt like when I started my practice, I was alone. I felt very lonely in, uh -huh. in dealing with the cases. Cause nobody would, nobody, I didn't, I was like you, I didn't think anybody wanted to help. Why would anybody want to help me? Right. Um, I had nothing to offer anybody else. Uh, and then you start asking for help and people are more than willing and you start getting some help and you start get some advice and documents and you take a CLE class and this and that and make some friends. And next thing you know, you got your little group, but it is to let people know that at, there's all kinds of strategies out there and there's no wrong one, right? If you want to stay a solo or you want to have a one employee firm or you want to grow to 50 and you want to be uh, advertising on billboards. There's no wrong answer. It's just dependent on what's the right fit for you. Uh, it, it, you know, it sounds like even after, even though it's been a while since you got out of that, you know, I'm going to put it as a bad relationship with that employee, that still kind of sits with you and you're very cautious even today on trying to go down that path. Well, because, you know, I uh, have bad taste in employees maybe because I had recent, you know, like another round where I tried another avenue of employment ship, right? And it didn't, it was really, really bad. And so now I'm just like, man, but you know, I think it's like listening to you and there's other, other, some of your other podcasts, right? The other guests talked about like, I think Reza for sure on the hiring process, you're talking about the hiring process. And that's something that, again, I was never intentional on. And I was just like, ah, oh, you sound good. Okay. Come in and just, how hard can this be? Right. It's not how it works. And yeah. we grew up in, you know, in the restaurant industry and, you know, hiring people in the restaurant was difficult. And my mom used to, she'd be like, well, your law firm, everyone should want to work for you. I'm like, no, it's not about who wants to work. It's who can, you know what I mean? Who right. has a skill. But, uh, yeah, I mean, again, you know, I think I, you know, I've tried, cause I tried the VA stuff, right. The virtual assistant stuff. And I just can work. I don't think it's a good fit for me. Like a true solo. I think there's a lot of things that it needs to be curated a certain way and, and all that. And so like, you know, I tried that the last year, it just wasn't, it wasn't what I needed. I think, you know, there's things I need and I need to identify that and I need to go get it and be intentional about it. But I think that's a big, a big, big thing is that not being intentional, letting the kind of world happen to you, letting the business happen to you, letting the business do you versus you doing the business is a, is a big problem. But you know, business can be very, very forgiving. I mean, you can, you can lose millions of dollars. You can lose opportunities, but there's like a train, there's another one coming. You just, but you got to be on there to grab it and do it. So I can look back and say, oh, I missed out on all this opportunity to do it this way, but I can still do it in a way that's successful. And I, you know, that's my plan is to do it and continue to do it in a way that's successful and continuously learning. But it'd be nice if I didn't have to learn it so hard. Yeah. Well, but, I, think, I mean, your you know, podcast is good though, because I listen you know, to everyone's stories, right? And I'm like, oh man. And it's hard though too. Like if you're if you're a real solo, if you're coming out now solo, like it's you gotta really understand what people are saying because this could be abstract, right? Until you start going through it. But if you hear it, listen to it, start going through it and start catching it, like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I need to I need to do this. Cause I think uh there's another guy who went out. I'm like, man, I'll give you if you want any advice, it is start looking for help now. Cause that's yeah. the hardest part, right? Even, you know, even if you don't have any money, but if you have a little bit of settlement money, put it aside for three months, you'll know if they're working out because the employees should be making you money, not costing yeah. you money. Right. Right. Well, I mean, that's the whole point. I mean, that's every business, right? The employees are supposed to be generating yeah. revenue, not costing yeah. revenue. 
And so if they're not doing it in three months, it's probably a problem, right? Yeah. So but there's, you know, a lot of a lot of lessons and you know, it's never ending in business. Never, never ending. But Yeah. It's I mean, and and you know, I think you have kind of really sent the message that the life of a solo um is, is very there's going to be peaks and valleys, right? You talked about that, both financially, a couple cases settled, great, you're flush, we're moving forward. Then there's a dry spell, and then you're kind of scared. Maybe you don't get any new cases for two months, and then you get like 20 cases, and then you know you hire somebody, it doesn't work out. Maybe you hire somebody, it works out, and then they quit. And you know, and that's kind of how it goes. But I think that's true for any business, and it's important to let people know that because so many people go, well, what if I start a law firm and I fail? And I always say, well, what does that mean? What, is, what does fail mean? Because everybody fails in different spots. They hire the wrong people. They take on the wrong client. They take on some client they shouldn't have taken on. They refer to somebody they shouldn't have referred to. Everything is technically a failure, but really, what does that actually mean? I don't think there is a failure, especially if, as long as you don't commit malpractice, as long as you keep your license active and, and try to avoid you know losing your license, you're probably fine, right? Yeah. And it's really like, do you want to keep going? So I think the failure is like, it's all trite and you know, very cliche, but like the failures and the quitting, right? And so if you keep, like you show up every day and you like, you're half decent, right? The cases will come. And when I first went out and I would talk to like attorney and like that would have 20, 30 years experience, you know, at lunch or at a networking, I'd be like, man, I just went out, but I'm really scared about getting cases. He goes, oh no, I'm still am, you know, because you know, the, the ones that don't advertise. Problem is if you advertise, now you have an advertising bill every month you got to make on top of everything else. And there's no guarantee cases come in, right? So it's kind of like pick your poison and it's just no, there's no clear cut way to, to define, you know, failure. I think it's all individual and like, you know, there's a lot of things I feel like I'm, I'm, I failed at. Then I'm like, well, did I want to have like 18 offices with 500 lawyers? Like, I don't know if I what, would want that. Because the thing, if I'd wanted it, I would have focused on it and gotten it. You know, I like being kind of a national lawyer, national law firm. But having those relationships with my clients and being, you know, they all have my cell phone, right? So I talk to them and give them updates and, you know, sometimes they're not happy for something, but I get to get on the phone with them right away and be like, hey, look, let's fix this up. Let's fix this, you know? Whereas a lot of law firms, you'll never meet that the lawyer that you hired, right? So the failure is all man v. man, I think, in this yeah. in this you know, industry here. Yeah, it, it definitely agree. I definitely agree. I don't think there really is any kind of, there's, you know, the failure is in the quitting. I like that. That's a really good one. Um, you know, let's talk a little bit about, you You had kind of alluded to this earlier, but, and I'm going to, since you brought it up, I'm bringing it up is, you know, you kind of went through a bit, a bad experience and we don't have to name any names, but you went through kind of a bad experience that I think is a, is a good, it's a good story to share. Um, if you're willing to share it, I think it's important for people to know. If not, we can cut it if you don't like it, but yeah, you know, I, what do you think? Yeah. I mean, which one I had like a thousand bad experiences, but I think <laughs> on our talk, the one you're talking about, the one that like, you know, probably have some, some PTSD from that, you know, there's an importance to, to like trusting the right people. And it's sometimes you just don't know, right. You can follow your gut or whatever, but I think we talked, we talked about this before where like, you know, on your case, right. Tell my clients, the most important decision is to hire the right lawyer. And what does that mean? Right. Okay. Hire a lawyer. Well, you know, the one that's going to like care and, and, and work a case up and talk to you and, and build, you know, and be there for you and not threaten to bail if, you know, they don't get their way or anything like that. And so I think from, you know, a client perspective, cause you know, I was you know, a client at one point with, with my own case um, and things went in, went south. And then, you know, kind of a segue to that is that, you know, aligning yourself with the, the people that you're going to do business with. Right is a big, big issue because you could be working with someone for three, four or five years, think your buds, think your homies, think your friends, work on cases together. And all of a sudden a big case comes along and, you know, money doesn't change people. It reveals people, right? Like it's you, you told me that. And, um, and I think there's a really, really big, uh, lesson in, in making sure that number one, when you have a case and you want to associate someone that, you know, for me, it was like, well, I've done business guy for, you know, five years. We've done it this way. It's fine. We got it. We still got it in writing, you know, but you just don't know how people are going to act. So, you know, I think you're probably alluding to like the whole referral or co-counseling, you know, situation where you can get a case and then 
someone could try to settle the case behind your back without them you knowing it, right? And try to scalp the money. For me, you know, the lesson out of that was there were a lot of lessons out of that because that was probably one of the worst things that I had gone through as a lawyer. And I'm being real vague. I don't know why. Basically, I was working on this this case with this other lawyer, and um, I just didn't get the uh, the benefit of my bargain in terms of uh, the case itself, and I got kind of pushed out. And then they tried to sell the case kind of behind my back. I caught it. And then it was like two years of like basically litigation until I, I got my money. And the person who controls a client controls a case. And in my situation, I did like did let kind of let the client develop a relationship with the other lawyer and his lawyers. And so what that did was that alienated, I felt like me and the client and then them sort of the nation had more relationship with them. But the client to kind of you know say what he they wanted to say to frame things the way he wanted to frame it, but you know it was really really rough because now you know I was very very gun shy on like who am I going to associate this case with? Who can I trust to take cases with? Who can I refer cases with? And like you know I mean I tell you all the time like hey I referred a case to so and so and like it was a disaster like no updates, I don't even know what's going on, never got paid whatever. I don't even know the client's okay. I'm gonna call the client you know, so. There's so many variables. It's so, so tough just to be a lawyer, to be your own law firm. And now you have all of these other um, accidental crisis threats coming at you, other lawyers, you know, clients, whoever it is, legislation, million, a million, million things. But I, I don't know. Did I, did I share the lesson out of that? Because I want to, yeah, you yeah. Know, I, I mean, I, I think the experience. lesson is twofold. I think the lesson is twofold. One being, you know, be careful who you trust. And just because you've known somebody for a little while, don't assume that when money gets involved, that it's going to be all just the way it was, you know, and that's an important lesson. And I think secondly is, hey, things are going to go bad, but it's okay. You still find a way through it. You still end up, you know, on the other side, you had to get into a lawsuit over this. As you mentioned, there were two years of litigation you had to deal with. It, it ended up, you ended up winning, of course, but Nobody wants to deal with that. That's not the point. Nobody wants to deal yeah, with that. You know, and I really tried every freaking every every single possible way, every concession that was, you know, reason and some were even unreasonable to resolve it, to get it to go away, you know, to just to make peace. And it's it's just a shame that, you know, there's people in our profession that are like that, which of course we know that because we see it all the time. I mean, what Girardi, you know, Avenatti, like just those are just a couple that are close to LA. Just absolute, Murdoch. Dirt, you know, Murdoch, you know, on, on oh yeah, we're here on South Carolina, Murdoch, right? Absolute dirtbags, just scum, scum, you know, and you're like, wow, you're a lawyer, you're supposed to, you know, do no harm to your clients. I know that's a medical thing, but you know, for law, we're yeah. supposed to, we take an oath too, right? So. Yeah. Well, I think, I think, I think guys like me and you, you know, that didn't grow up around lawyers and don't have lawyers in the family. We just kind of looked at lawyers as these revered folks that were different people. They were just, you know, wore the white hat. They were just kind of at this level that was just different than everybody else. And then you become a lawyer and you assume people live up to that standard of what a lawyer should be, what an advocate should be. And you realize like, no, that's not true. Of course, there's humans. They're all humans and humans are flawed. And then there's landmines that you can step in and you just have to be careful that Sometimes a bad relationship, whether it's with a lawyer or an employee or whatever, ends up being a landmine that sets you back. Yeah, and it's it's hundred percent true. And like I didn't grow up with lawyers. I mean, all the, the lawyers, the doctors, all the professionals were like on pedestals. You know, my family, like, God, oh, there's a, a doctor. Oh, it's a lawyer. You know, it's like they don't they you know they don't commit crimes. It's just right. blue collar dirtbags are commit crimes. You know, and then you kind of get a kind of go to law school and you get around them or you're seeing the news things you're like you see in the news you're like oh it's an outlier that's just a crazy guy but then you like you start to meet people and you start to deal with them you're like really like for real okay wow it's a culture shock to see that and what's always been drilled to me you know it's like you have the lawyer you have your reputation you have a reputation as a lawyer right as a person but in the community that's your reputation and i just won't sell it you know, I won't sell it, not for any case, not for any money, not for anything like I, you know, and the fact that people do, but it's just so much like apathy now right. with stuff like that. You know what I mean? Like people do things and they're just like, meh, you know, like, yeah, but they're giving me cases. Yeah, but I'm getting cases from them or what? I mean, that seems to be the big like thing here, right? Like, yeah, he did it to you, but like, so what? Uh, it was just money, right? It was just this and that. And like, 
this particular lawyer, they had done to me, to the client, what they did to me, they'd be disbarred. And it's just like, the whole idea here isn't that they're doing it to clients. The whole idea is like they're doing it to anybody, the character and fitness. Right, right. But the standards, yeah. as we know, the California bar isn't exactly, is, you know, isn't exactly the um, the enforcer that they they should be. And hopefully things change now. I know my life got harder with it. <laughs> yeah, seriously, you know, right? All of us. Thanks. Um, so it is just something to, to be wary of to keep your circle, you know, small. And really, I don't want to say like, don't like not trust anybody. But check yourself and check that. You know, if like we for cases, we still do the 1.5, 1, whatever it's called. Yeah, and like all the time. That's fine. And I'm not offended. And I think what it is, you know, it's, right. you have to do it because it's the law. The client gets a copy. And if we ever have a dis- disagreement, we can just go point back at it. See, like, like remember that? You're like, oh, yeah, remember that. Yeah. What happens I 100% is- I 100% agree. I 100% agree. I've had, I've had lawyers that, you know, want to refer me a case and they'll be like, hey, look, man, you know, I trust you and everything, but is it cool if we do a 151? I was like- of course, of course. Yeah. What are you talking about? Like, we should absolutely do one every time. And if I refer you one, we should do one too. I mean, what do you, you there should you know, be no hesitation there. Um, you know, and I think I took a case a couple of years ago. This one I just settled, and I don't think we actually did a one five. Like, we might have, we might have. I got to look in the file. But I remember the referring attorney said, you know, the case only goes, oh, cool. What's our split? I just told, I mean, it's 50 50. Right. I didn't try to be like, oh, you know, I think we said like you get a third or like you get a quarter or let me check. You know what I mean? Like I knew what it was. And, you know, from my end, I know I'm just not going to do it. But just for the overall consensus piece, I think that's a good practice. And it also, again, it's one thing to just kind of check. And then, you know, for me on that other you know relationship with that that attorney, it was just I think I just got real comfortable and I thought a relationship was something it wasn't. And I want to, you know, everyone relates to like friendships or relationships. It's like, you know, I thought we were dating, but clearly, you know, they yeah. did it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Yeah. it was like, no, we're not, that's not the level we were. Or we, we, you know, I thought we were friends. And yeah. it was like, we're never friends. What are you talking about? And I'm like, I definitely misread you for five years. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. Like, right. All like we were that. living together and I, like we shared office space for like three years and we hung out and it was just really, it was just a really kind of a mind, a mind blow. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Like, okay. But it's just also gets you to think like when there's business involved and stuff, again, you got to protect yourself, got to protect the client. And at the end of the day, I mean, I lost a lot in those, you know, those lessons cost me a lot. They were like, you know, I want to say, you know, they were bombs. I want to say nuclear bomb. I survived, but they were big like carpet bombs that really wiped me out and emotionally and financially and things like that. So it's a, it's a, it's a tough, it's a tough task, but I yeah. definitely, um, you know, better for it, you know, moving forward. And, you know, you know, like I've kind of faced it again and I'm trying to, you know, be like, Hey, look, I've seen this situation. I've seen the writing on the wall. I need to, I need to like make sure that I'm protecting everybody you know, myself yeah. included, because at the end of the day, we don't get paid unless we um, collect the money, but to collect the money, you have to have the case. If you don't have the case, yeah. you didn't know going to get the money. And it's just, you know, one of those things, but there's a lot of good, a lot of good people out there that I've met. I think, you know, it's really, I mean, that's how we met. We may yeah. never have met at a, had that never happened to me, you know, cause I would probably still right. live in that little bubble in that shell, you know, never gotten out and explored other and, and know, just to clarify for, for those that are outside of California, the 151 is the California ethics code as it relates to fee sharing and having the client sign off and things like that. So just to just want to clarify that point. But you said a good point is that all of these things that have happened, these were not obviously these were not positive experiences, but but you survived them. You're here. You're nine years out. You're doing well for yourself. You've got, you know, now three offices in three different states. And that's an important thing to for people to know that that perseverance that it isn't going to be a straight linear line to the moon and everybody gets rich in three years or five years or whatever it may be these things are going to happen in one one fashion or another it may not be the exact same fashion that you got it it may be in some other fashion you know i've had partners that we've had to buy out for various reasons we've had you know everybody has something you know bad client that really just ruins your life or or does something that's really horrible to you and, um, you know, maybe it's a lack of diligence on an attorney's part at some point, but whatever, right? These things are going to happen, but you get through them and you power through them and you stay focused 
and you focus on the client. You know, you've mentioned this a few dozen times or a few times now, which is like, at the end of the day, if you just kind of take care of the client, really everything else will take care of itself. Yeah. And especially just maintaining that relationship with the client. I mean, it's just so important that, you know, you control the, I mean, when I say control the client, it's like you control the relationship. You have the direct relationship with the client. Because when I refer cases out, I still check in with the client. So I'm like, hey, how's the experience? How's it going? Everything good? Because, you know, that falls on me. And I mean, I've had some not so great experiences referring cases out where the client's like, hey, we're bailing. And I'm like, Ugh. you know, because it comes on me like I referred you over there and now you're leaving because they didn't do right by you. At least you didn't feel it, you know, that. And now, you know, number one, that reflects on my, you know, reputation and because I'm a word of mouth lawyer and I'll advertise. Number two, now I'm not getting a fee because they're going to go to some random lawyer who doesn't owe me a referral fee. Maybe I have some kind of lien on it, but I'm not trying to cloud the client's case, you know, unless it's something significant, right? right? But it's just really, really just business management, right? So it's, it's managing your, and look, the cases are inventory. People have cases, right? We don't have cases. People have cases. We represent people. But yeah. our caseload is like our inventory. And so you got to like manage it. And in that inventory is an inventory manager and that's the client. They control the case, right? So just really, really important, I think, a lesson to not just like set it and forget it or, you know, send the client over there and think that, you know, everything's going to be amazing and that that referral firm, whether you're relationship with them or not, is actually going to care about you, especially if it turns up like the case is worth more than you thought or something because they see that and they're like, oh, wait, we just got them a million bucks. What do they do? Because then if people start questioning, right? If it's a $50,000, you know, $100,000, like, oh, whatever, give them his 10, 10 grand. But, you know, sometimes you never know if a case turns for the best how people are going to react, especially people who don't have a good relationship with money and they see it as um, uh, an end-all, be-all, um, above all else. No, I mean, that's a good point, right? Like sometimes, you know, when you're coming up in the game and you're learning, there's a temptation to say, oh, okay, well, I finally got a really good case. Let me send it to this firm so they can they can be up and coming too and we can grow together and then you realize well there's a reason why everybody sends the cases to an established firm because you're right when you've got a situation like you ran into where somebody where the money mattered so much to them they were willing to sell their integrity for it that's a problem yeah i mean that was a, and it's it was not a, that it doesn't happen on big firms i mean look at girardi right that's a yeah. great example but that's there is some sense of hey if somebody's not so desperate for the money there are it's a lot easier for them to just keep everything clean. Right. I mean, the case that I had that was a center of that situation, I didn't even know if it was a case. I didn't even know how big it was. That was a big case. And I remember texting the guys like, hey, this client, the, the former client, the, the, the thing that like got me was that the clients that I represented on that case, I just, it was a debt collection creditor case that I got a really good result for them. Like I, did, I was surprised. I, I didn't believe it. But, um, it was um, a referral from them. And, and I remember having a conversation. We had a meeting or something with the clients. And I remember driving back from that. And the, I was talking to the the attorney. And I was like, you know, I, I worked my ass off for this case. I worked my ass off for it to earn the referral. I was telling them about the case. I'm like, you know, this is what happened. This and that. Like, I was so stressed out. I didn't know if I was going to get it done. And, like, I was able to, like, negotiate. And I did it. And I was like, so I really feel, like, vindicated. Like, I, I earned the, the reputation to get the referral of the case. And so yeah. I took it to the wrong lawyer, clearly, right? Not on, on a lot of levels, but there's a benefit, you know, to going to the ones that have the results. Cause I thought, you know, oh, well, you know, let's do this together and build up and then we'll get a trial dog at the end, you know, and we'll all celebrate and build, you know, thing. But just again, being naive, not understanding, not realizing, not, not really taking care of myself, worrying too much about other people is the other thing, right? In order for you to take care of other people, you got to take care of yourself first. You got to be strong, right? It's like the whole airplane analogy. Like you got your kids on the plane and it's going down or it's turbulence and the oxygen masks drop. You got to put yours on first before your kids, which sounds like, oh no, I would never do that. Well, you're going to die then if you don't. You know? Yeah, right. Like, if you, you pass be, out, then neither one of you yeah, guys are getting out. That's exactly. Cool. So you have to be strong and, you know, take care of yourself and make sure that you're in a position to help. And there's, you know, just a way to help people and there's a way to keep your relationships and, 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 but then what gets lost in all this, right? A lot of times it's like the client, what's the best for the client? What's the best thing for the client? Like, is it, is you and your homie working on the case, the best thing for the client? Right. Right. There's a blind leading the blind, the best thing for the client. Right. And, and I think if you put that first, always, 
you can still benefit from it, you know? In the long run, I think you'll always benefit. You should always benefit from that because it is your yeah. interests are aligned. The more money they get, the more money we get. And as long as it's going to the right person, you'll get your piece. But it's it's tough, man. There's a lot of landmines. There's a lot of things, traps. A lot of people out there that are just nefarious that just care about you know because for whatever reason they they have to have the settlement. They can't live without it. And uh, it's just something uh, that in this solo world. Something that yeah, but nine years here, up. man. Nine years later, you're still here. You're still, you know, you're I'm, still getting the calls every month. You feel like cases are coming in. They still keep I, coming in. Look, I get I get calls every day, right? I mean, I'm knocking wood here. Like I do, I got like three today, and you know, again, now the struggle's like, oh, I gotta, I got I really, you know, we talked about this, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it. I have to hire, I have to hire right because my clients deserve that. I deserve it in terms of like getting these cases out because I'm like, I work. Basically, the whole country time zone, right? Every time zone. I've got cases in California, Texas, South Carolina, somewhere in betweens, you know? And so it'd be nice to have somebody to to kind of take, you know, take over at like, you know, 5 p.m. Eastern. Yeah, right. So I could like, you know, go go enjoy dinner for once. But yeah, it's it's good. And the cases are, are still there. And, you know, I'm really trying to just keep, keep doing right with the clients and, and making sure that my referral partners, my co-counsels, all of that are kind of trimmed, you know, honed in. And that's the most, you know, the whole idea of having the right people in the right place, the right people in the right cases. Not every case is right for everybody, right? I'm not taking, you know, you got to, you have to recognize that. You have to recognize what cases go to what people and what firms, who's good at what, right. you know, right. in terms of whether resources, experience, this and that. And it's, you know, it's also, you want to get experience, right? So what better to do it than take it to someone who knows what they're doing so you're not like blind leading the blind. Like, oh, we're going to learn this together right. and then we got to, you know, lawyer by listserv, which is like a horrible right. experience. You know what I mean? Right. The whole lawyer right. by listserv, like, got to ask all these questions on the listserv and hopefully I get something and I don't want to give up the equity, but I'm like, I've always been one to, I mean, take half the equity, take it. But, you know, I want my, I want my experience in return. Right. And my, my half. You know, yeah. So you you brought up you brought up earlier um, the idea of social media not really you know being around as you were building up your practice. And you know how much I love your Instagram, and I tell everybody that they got to follow because it is probably the best follow. It's one of those where I get texts from my other friends that don't really know you, like they know you kind of through me. And they'll mm-hmm. be like, Yanni's Instagram is the best follow. I get excited when I see that he posted a new story. So what has changed for you? I mean, obviously you were not building your practice through Instagram. Now you're like, everybody wants to follow you. They think you're hilarious on there. So how did you get so comfortable on it? Well, first of all, that is very kind and um, a little hyperbolic for you to say in a good way, because, you know, I'm no, not, it's true, I'm man. Not really it's hilarious. But you know, like my, my, my personal one is like private, right? That's not out for the universe. Like I, like everyone's like, oh, I got to make it public. I'm like, like some things don't have to be public. Right. Right. And I do agree, like a lot of that would probably help me if it was. Um, but I do have for all you followers at home, all you listeners out there, coast to coast, at get Yanni is my public one, which I am actively working, getting my videos edited to put on there. So a lot of the stories that I have posted in the past, I'm going to repurpose and like produce them properly and put them on there for the whole world to enjoy. So don't worry. There's a lot of good and we got a lot of big plans coming for uh for stuff, we're actually going to make a little studio right back here. I don't know if you can see that stuff, but we're going to do some fun stuff there. But like, look, the whole social media thing, I mean, I don't know, you asked me like what happened. Like, I just, I guess like the culture shift, right? Yeah. Because it was like, oh, you're on social media. Like that's for kids, you know, like that's for children. And, you know, eventually I think just like the, the, the business kind of side grew into it. And like, I think it's, I think it's fun. It's easy. And I think the other thing is like, it's just easy now. Like it's so simple to go do a story and edit it and versus what it was even five years ago. Right. Um, you know, when I edit, I edit videos like five years ago and I'm like, oh, it takes me like three days. Now I can, you know, I can do it a couple hours and do it, do it well. Right. The social media outreach is really good because when I'm on a roll posting, I definitely get cases just from my, my closed, you know, my 700 followers. And I remember, uh, recently a girl I know 
was she messaged me and it was like a week where I was posting like every day because the consistency is a big thing, right? Like you got to have that. And I was, she goes, oh, you need a personal injury. I, I got injured. I was about to call this other law firm, which is a big law firm here in South Carolina. Can you help me? And so like I got a case out of that just by putting myself out there. You know what I mean? Right. The big thing is like for me is to not just be like everyone else. And then also, but it's not to be different to be different. It's got to be like a value different, right? It's got to be like, it's got to be different, but it still has to be within the realm of like what's going to attract and what's going to entertain. Yeah. And, and, and it has to be you because if it's not, well, you, if it's not your personality, you're going to give up on doing it and it's not comfortable. And you know, yeah, no, it, it's, it's, it's true, man. It's like, it's know, like being, it's like being in trial too. Cause my last trial, the, I talked to a juror and you know, she was like, and actually she didn't even stick around. Like I went for a long walk afterwards cause I lost. And I just ran into her randomly downtown San Diego. And she goes, oh, weren't you the lawyer who just tried that case? I'm like, weren't you a juror? She goes, yeah. And so we were talking to her. I just remember like asking her all kinds of hard questions. And the one thing that stuck out of her, she was like, you know, you just didn't seem like you were being yourself. Mm. And it was true because I had copied an opening from one lawyer, a closing from another lawyer, a questioning style from another lawyer. I literally shook my fist for justice like this to the jury, like, this isn't unjust, you know? And she was like, it wasn't that serious of a case. And like every case is serious, but my emotions in my emotive state, in my act did not match the nature of the case. And they just saw through yeah. it. I just wasn't comfortable. And so on social media too, right? Like you just gotta be yourself and like not everyone's gonna like me. Oh, there's haters. Yeah. You know what I mean? But if people ain't hating, you're doing something wrong. Yeah, I mean, like, that's right. Hey, no, that's true. That's a good place for us to wrap it up. We're getting yeah. up on time. I got like one last question. I always ask, I always love to ask the guests. And so I'm going to ask you the same thing is if you could go back to, you know, 2012, 13, 14 and talk to the younger Yanni, um, what, what would you say to him? Man, that's a good question. I would, um, I would, I would say, look, uh, you need to just be a lot more confident in who you are and what you have to offer. So I think that was a big thing that I didn't realize, like that I do have like a lot to offer. I do have skill sets that were still marketable at the time. I just always felt inadequate because like, I don't have this experience. I don't have this. I don't have that. So I tell myself, go and knock on more doors, apply to more firms. Even if you don't think you're getting hired, you know, just go and expand and, and look at those opportunities because I think, you know, you, you miss out on things that you, you don't ask, you don't get sort of thing, you know? So I would just, that would, I would tell myself to, to really just kind of reach out wider and just be a little bit more um, persistent with some of those like job applications. I love that. And I also love that. buy yeah. Bitcoin, buy Bitcoin. And buy sell Bitcoin. Yeah, 20, buy Bitcoin too. 21. Yeah. Thank you, Yanni, at Get Yanni. Thank you all for listening or watching. We'll see you on the next episode of Bootstrap Solo. And remember, just because guys like Yanni make it look effortless doesn't mean that it is. And one ask from us, from the Bootstrap family, if you enjoyed the pod, Please share where you share stuff, whether it's LinkedIn, Instagram, TikTok, etc. We can only grow and spread the love if you let others know about it. And so we'd appreciate your help in doing that. Thank you again and see you next time on Bootstrap Solo. Bootstrap Solo.